So hello, my name is Tony Chulich. I served 14 years in the US Navy flying GE-powered F-14 Tomcats and F-18 Super Hornets. And I also served in the Navy, like Ernest said, for 12 and a half years on active duty flying the MH-53 Echo helicopter. I was born in Croatia, which was then part of the former communist Yugoslavia. My father and mother, who are here today with us in the audience, my father was uh, born to a fairly poor family. <laughs> and thank you. Um, and my mother was actually born to a fairly well-off family, but because she was female, she didn't receive an inheritance from her family. So they didn't have much when they got married, but they saw a better life for themselves in the U.S. And they were able to immigrate. And soon after arriving into the U.S., they came to the South Bronx. And sorry, no Ellis Island story here. It was the 1970s, and their ship was a 747. <laughs> But they couldn't speak a lick of English, and after paying their bills uh, after, during the month, they would have about $10 to their name. And uh, my father had a job as a manual laborer, and my mom picked up a, an extra job cleaning apartments in order to make <coughs> ends meet. So my favorite part of the story is how they learned English. They learned it by watching Sesame Street, and they did so on a television that Miro found discarded on the side of the road and, and fixed it. So my father received his lucky break by getting a true electrician's job, which he was trained in, and over the next 25 years, worked his way up through the industry to become chief engineer of several different plants. What stuck with me when I was young and hearing these stories was their ambition to seek more in life and the courage and initiative to do it in a place thousands of miles away from where they came home, called home. Imagine doing this yourself, moving to, say, China, and taking your young family with you, not knowing how to speak the language and you know, having to take a job at, say, a butcher shop to make ends meet even though you were a trained engineer. I mean, it was quite a feat. And the work ethic that it instilled in me st stays with me today. So Katie, in contrast, came from a hardworking middle-class family in rural Western Maryland. Her father was a second-generation owner of a produce and trucking company, and her mom was fifth generation in a family flower shop and greenhouse. So my dad, he worked six and a half days a week, pretty much 12 hours a day, and he fell asleep on the couch most nights at seven o'clock. My sister and I were always very careful to be quiet because if we woke him up, he would be really grumpy, and his days usually started at 5 a.m. I can remember my mom working until like three and four in the morning during the various holidays, and she would come home long enough just to take a shower and then hurry back so that they would be ready to start the floral deliveries for the recipients so they could get them, say, on Valentine's Day. What I learned growing up in those two family businesses was how hard you have to work with very little time off and sometimes do the jobs you don't necessarily like to but must in order to get the job done. And my parents made it very, very clear that my sister and I were not going to be the next generation in either of the family businesses. So with regard to my service, it started with a very early interest in aviation. From the time I was about five, my father used to drive me to our local airport, he parked the car, brought me on the hood, sit next to me, and we'd watch little Cessnas take off and land for hours on end. And if that was the inoculation, the several fighter aircraft coffee table books dog-eared from use, the multiple plastic model airplanes hanging from my bedroom ceiling with fishing wire so it looked like they were flying, <laughs> and the fact that I could recite several scenes from Top Gun verbatim <laughs> meant that the fever had set in. So like a lot of five-year-old boys, Tony decided early on that he was going to fly the highest and the fastest aircraft, and he quickly realized that that had to be in the U.S. military. And soon after that, he realized the long road that it would take to get there. For me, I didn't always aspire to military service. Um, I realized that, you know, in my area where I grew up, joining the military wasn't something that a middle class girl did. And so after the fact, I've had several high school guidance counselors come up to me and tell me pretty much they thought I was nuts. Um, but forbidden to become a, grocer, uh, a second generation grocer or a floral designer, um, my mom would make comments at different points of my childhood, and, and she would mention serving in the military, which is something that she really wanted to do, but was never allowed because her father forbade it. And she would make comments like, if I had joined the military, I could have done X, or I could have traveled to Y, 
or I could have retired by now. And so those really always resonated. And I thought, well, when my time comes, I'll give it a try. And if I don't like it, then I don't have to stay forever. But you think about the academy? So I did, um, but it was a weird fit because I wasn't athletic, I wasn't disciplined, and I didn't belong to anything that would make you think I was a good candidate to do so. Um, I did, however, fall in love with the pomp and circumstance. And so I thought, you know, I'll try it. And my parents didn't come directly out and say that they didn't think I could do it, but they really didn't think that I had it in me. And so that became my motivation to go forward. So Katie took a different path and she decided to enlist. So um, while I was waiting for the results of those applications, I was less than 18, and I knew I wasn't going to go to college and follow my peers. It just wasn't the right path for me. So I went with my dad down to the recruiting station, and he had to go because he had to formally sign the papers. And I can vividly remember the moment, sitting in the chair next to the recruiter's desk, and he was sitting you know, catty corner to me, and he was offering me the opportunity to go take a qualifying test for the Naval Nuclear Power Program, which was a great program for the Navy. And so I kind of turned around and looked up over my shoulder at my dad standing here, waiting for him to say, yes, this is what you're supposed to go do. And I didn't get that answer. In fact, what I got was a much different comment, something that changed my, my parents and I have a relationship for the foreseeable future after that. And my dad kind of looked down over my shoulder at me and said, you know what, Kid Kate, don't look at me. This is your life now. So we'll fast forward in time a little bit, 2004, which is when Tony and I's paths first crossed. I was a midshipman, a semester away from graduating and trying to figure out if aviation was the right community for me. So I was an F-18 instructor at the Super Hornet Training Squadron in lovely Lemoore, California, in the middle of the desert. And yes, we did meet in an officer's club during happy hour. <laughs> but. Trust me, I resisted the temptation to sing I Lost That Loving Feeling to her. So for the ladies in the room, um, I, will, I will tell you that pretty much all men are handsome in a flight suit, and Tony was no different that night. And he that. might not have sang the song then, but he and his friends did sing it at our wedding, um, when, on our wedding night. <laughs> So Katie was an incredibly persistent and dedicated midshipman. She would wake up very early every morning and head to the ready room to wait for an empty back seat as instructors would go flying by themselves. And you know, her peers were probably sleeping off the previous night's activities or going to the gym or the pool. As a result, by the end of her time in Lemoore, she had racked up a total of six back seat rides in an F-18 when the normal midshipman would be lucky to get one or two. So in a subsequent day, I came in, I had an empty back seat, walked in the ready room, saw Katie standing there, asked if she wanted to go. I said yes. You can imagine what she said. <laughs> uh, but shortly thereafter, I got pulled aside by my operations officer, and he gave me a direct order that she was not to have any more rides because he was worried about the expectations she would set with her unit back home. So I had to break the bad news to her and Which, tell her it wasn't going to happen. I, it, doesn't, it doesn't stick out in my memory right. that he told me no. It'll be important in a second. <laughs> so I finish uh, the brief, go down, get dressed, head to my chat. And as I'm in my seat, strapping in, who do I see walking down the flight line behind a fellow instructor of mine towards a jet but Katie? So I was sitting there after he said I couldn't go, and another instructor came in, and he said, I'm walking to the jet right now. I've got an empty back seat. Do you want to go? And I'll ask you guys what you would have done, but <laughs> this might be my last jet ride ever, and I wanted to get that picture, so I said yes. What was great about that time was it did really help me figure out that I wanted to go into aviation. Um, but it also helped me figure out that I didn't like to fly in loops and, and do that kind of thing. So I ended up selecting helicopters. And in particular, I, uh, I chose the H-53, which is the Navy's biggest helicopter. And it has three GET-64 engines on it. So a lot of people say two engines are better than one. I think three are way better than two. So just to understand the sheer size of this aircraft, you could take your car and drive it up into the rear of the cargo area. It's that big. I mean, they even had a patch that used to say, piss me off and I'll lift your house. 
So I'm actually glad that he likes that patch because we have very healthy Helos versus Jets competition in our household. And our 18 month old, or when she was 18 months old, she absolutely knew the difference between the two. Yeah, so an airplane would be flying over and they'd say, look, airplane. Daddy flies airplanes, mommy flies helicopters. <laughs> I mean, she even brought home a t-shirt once for me that said, Maverick can't hover. <laughs> there, there are a lot of things that Maverick can do, but low and slow is not one of them. I did not wear it. <laughs> so all joking aside, um, you know, a lot of times pilots and, and anyone in the military will have some sort of defining moment in their career that kind of shapes how they will operate for years to come, and I'm no different. So mine happened during the flight in which this photo was taken, and it's one of my favorite photos to date because you can see the ship flying, the ship up in the background and I'm flying around the boat, but the flight was absolutely not one of them. So it was my first deployment, and we were based in Japan, but we had embarked on a ship to Thailand to, execute, uh, to participate in an exercise. And things change, as they often do, and a typhoon had hit the country of Burma, or Myanmar, as many people know it, just devastating the low-lying country. So our mindset quickly changed from executing this mine-hunting exercise to preparing for potential humanitarian aid, disaster relief-type missions. I hadn't been a, a qualified co-pilot for very long, meaning I was incredibly dependent on the um, aircraft commander to continue to teach me. And so one day, a routine training flight turned into a passenger transfer. So we were operating between two ships. You can see them there, and I'm going to start at number one and work through. So we left our ship, we flew to our sister ship, and picked up some people that had to get to shore. On the way to shore, where that red star is, about 12 miles out from the aircraft or from the airport, and very much still over the water, we got a warning light in our cockpit. It illuminated, and it was unfortunately one of the very select few warning lights that could make you execute an emergency water landing if it was accompanied by secondary indications. It was a, called a main gearbox chip light. Luckily, we didn't have any secondaries. And the crew executed the emergency procedures in a very calm and collected manner. But the situation was extremely tense, and everyone felt it. Unfortunately for the passengers in the back, they felt it too, as we made a very abrupt altitude change to get down to um, a lower level in case we had to execute a quick flare and land in the water. We made it to shore, and we shut down. And the crew pulled the chip detector. And, and you can see us kind of looking at it there. And they found a sizable metal chunk. In it, which means that the main gearbox could have been deteriorating. The pilot in command decided that we were going to continue our mission, which was to return and drop off some cargo at that ship that we picked up passengers. And um, this is a really big deal that we were going to keep going, because if we would have been at home, that aircraft would have been hard down. It would have been removed from the flight schedule, and they would have gone and done extensive maintenance to figure out the cause. Because I was junior, I questioned whether we should keep going, but I didn't say anything about it, and we continued on. So we started back to the ship, and the return flight was equally tense, right? Because we were all just hawked on the gauges to make sure nothing, nothing popped up. We landed at the ship to drop off cargo, and it was at sunset, and we had to delay to get the cargo off and to get gas. So by the time we were ready to return to our ship, for the end of the night, it was pitch black. And when I say pitch black, I mean, think about no stars, you go in your closet, you shut the door with the lights off, and that's the environment that we were gonna take off into. So we head back to our ship, and on the landing profile coming in, the tower gave us one of the very few mandatory calls, which was to wave off, because they perceived our landing profile was unsafe. And, and a wave off means, you immediately pull power and go around, and you would set up for another landing. Pilot in command, again, did not comply, and he continued in towards the ship. And we were very lucky that we did not hit the back of the boat that night. So at the end of the day, when we shut down and I was in my rack, safe and sound, I realized, A, I was a very lucky girl and B, that there were several things to be taken away. And so the first one was, there's no substitute for good training. 
because repetition ensures that we have the skills when they're needed and that we can execute with operational calm. Number two was that hindsight is awesome, 2020, right, and allows us to um, look back and realize we might not make the same decision if circumstances repeated themselves. And number three, my squadron rehashed this event over and over and over again for the next couple of months. And you know, I didn't speak up and affect the situation that I could have and that I should have. And I haven't been afraid to do so since. But it's tough to be continually criticized by your peers and the people that are ultimately your friends. Um, but I realized through that process that I could take it and I'm better for having been given the feedback and the opportunity to improve as a result. I deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan three times and coincident during my second deployment was the 2003 invasion of Iraq, which you all may know better as the shock and awe campaign. So we were there to provide support to the invading forces as they moved north towards Baghdad. And in a particular mission that stands out in my mind, we were assigned to provide t uh, support to a forward air controller. Now in general, over there, we had direct orders to stay above 20,000 feet. And this was to avoid being engaged by surface-to-air missiles. So while awaiting tasking on this flight, we received an urgent call from some friendly forces that were pinned down by enemy mortar and artillery fire. So we quickly proceeded to the target, and to our dismay, upon arriving, we saw a solid cloud deck right at 10,000 feet. Now this meant two things. We couldn't acquire the target visually to deconflict friendlies from the enemy, and we couldn't guide our weapons through the clouds. So as a flight lead, I had a decision to make, which was, do we descend below the 20,000 foot altitude? And in my mind, there was no question. I mean, that's why we were there, to support the guys and the gals on the ground. So we descended down, got below the cloud deck. Now, mind you, we're much uh, closer to the enemy and in, in the heart of the threat envelope. So we had to keep our airspeed up. We had to maneuver at high G, and we had to dispense flares continuously in order to avoid being uh, engaged by surface-to-air missiles. This made target acquisition really tough as we're cranking around these, in these circles. We literally had to kind of use World War II-style tactics to find the friendlies and deconflict and find the enemies. We were able to do it. At times, we were so low that we worried our bombs as we released them had enough time to arm. But we were able to employ four, uh, four bombs each, me and my wingman. At the end of that, the prudent thing to do would have been to egress very quickly because circling over the same piece of sky behind enemy lines is not necessarily good for your health. Uh, and my radar intercept officer actually made the call that we had no more weapons. But I reminded him, I said, hey, we still have 500 rounds of 20 millimeter cannon. And, uh, and of course, he asked the friendlies if they wanted some more, and you can imagine what their answer was. So we decided to stick around and continue to stray four to five more times, flying an aircraft as big as a flying tennis court and invisible to the enemy. But again, no question in my, in my mind, it was the right thing to do, and it's why we were there. We were lower to the ground, closer to the enemy, but that's, that's why we were there. Uh, at the end, the best part about it was hearing the happy Roger That calls from those folks on the ground. Um, I can only hope that we made a big difference in their day that day. But it's when you turn for home and the adrenaline and excitement drains from your system that you have a lot of time to think, and that's exactly what you do. And on this mission and even other missions where I was further behind enemy lines, I used to think, and I know it sounds kind of odd, but you know, pictures of past POWs would flash before my eyes, and I'd be like, wow, the only thing between me being a POW and getting home safely are these two engines. And I used to think, wow, I hope the guys and gals that designed the oil system on this thing were having a good day, <laughs> and that, you know, I hope those bearings are exactly round. So if anybody here worked on the F-110-400, thank you. <laughs> so you realize as you execute your mission, and that you're only able to do so because of a whole host of people that support the design, the manufacture, and the maintenance of that aircraft and platform through its entire life cycle. And look, this isn't just lip service about how much Tony and I like GE engines, albeit we do. Operators, when they can focus on flying their aircraft and fighting their platform, rather than worrying about whether their engines are going to work, that's when we know we here at GE have done our job. So you've heard our stories of such today, 
And so many of Katie and I's peers are still out there flying and commanding squadrons. Katie, in fact, is continuing to serve in the reserves, and she's going back in the very near future to fly the 53. These experiences are a big reason why we found GE and why we work here today and why we still feel like we serve and find purpose in what we do. And this isn't just specific to the military side of the business. I mean, both of my deployments, I came home on commercial aircraft because we were forward deployed over there. Um, so you realize, you know, and to us, the bring them home safely is just as much about the network or those folks that are in harm's way as the network of moms and dads and best friends and husbands and wives and cousins that are waiting on the safe return of their loved ones. And um, undoubtedly, many of you are part of this string of connections and have your own stories just like we do and feel this importance between these two purposes of where GE and the military cross. And we encourage you to remember on a daily basis that the things that you do pay it forward so that all of us as a collective whole get to experience the amazing feeling of military homecoming. Look, we're just two of many, many veterans here at GE that have dedication, dedicated a portion of their life to the service of their country. They, like us, have many stories to share, so don't be afraid to ask and engage them. So we'd like to recognize those veterans that are attending locally or virtually. Um, so please join me in giving them a round of applause. And if you're in the audience here today, if you could please stand up so we can recognize you. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you.